Your poem is less than three minutes, and as David pointed out, it has to be one poem. I didn't know that rule. One poem? One poem. Of less than three minutes? Yeah. It's so, on the sign up pad, but nobody sees it. Right here. If I were to just combine two short poems and not say, don't tell David. Don't break, don't pause. <laughs> Alright. Our next feature reader is Edgar Coons. Good. 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 You know who he is, and you can probably pronounce his name better than I can. He's a writer originally from New England. He is the author of a poetry collection, Tap Out, from Houghton Mifflin, which I believe appeared last week. Brand new. Tuesday. Tuesday. Alright, brand new. It is for sale here. You should buy it, please, afterwards. Um, yeah, so the book came out last Tuesday. He is a 2017 National Endowment of Arts Literature Fellow and a former Wallace Stegner Fellow at Stanford University. His work was recently featured by U.S. Poet Laureate Tracy K. Smith on her podcast, The Slowdown. He lives in Baltimore so now, so we will claim him as our own. He teaches at Goucher College. Here's that. Hi, uh, hello. Is this pretty good? Yeah. I love standing in this one. It's massive. I love being in the mic world. And I love this. My careers. And that's a cool choice, I think. I wrote a book. It came out on Tuesday. This is what it looks like. It feels good. Don't hold it in your hands. You two could hold it in your hands if you wanted to. I'm going to read a handful of poems from it. I remember Hurricane Sandy. Oh yeah. It's yeah. about three years, some years ago. I, at the time, I was working at a farm. I was working at Genesee Valley. Yeah. Genesee Valley Outdoor Learning Center. Art farm, art roast course. Uh, so I did a mix of, of work up there. And when Sandy came through, it knocked down a bunch of trees and, and messed up the fence line. So part of my job was cleaning up after that. This was around the same time that I found out my dad was homeless. Uh, and so this poem used to be a lot longer and a teacher told me, cut out all the shit about fixing up a farm and just get to the heart of it. And so that's what I tried to do. It's also, it does something that I think poems can do, right? It allows us, poetry allows us to access people and places that we might not otherwise be able to. After the hurricane. 300 miles north, my father bed down in the van by the Connecticut River. Snow tires rim deep in the soap. He has a wool horse blanket tacked inside the windshield. A pair of extra pants bunched into a pillow. He has a paper bag with partially smoked butts, a paw socks cap, a zippo. He has state-sponsored cell phone units and a camo jacket hung on the side view to drive. He can see the Costco parking lot through the trees, swelling and emptying out. He wants to fix things with his wife. He wants the couch to crash on. He wants a drink. He wants sex. He has a few cans of kidney beans and a tin of shop right tuna. Wrinkled plastic piss bottles lie in the dash. Sometimes he walks out to the river and lets the wind sip his lank and matted hair. Sometimes he peels his socks and stands in the murky current and thinks about his wife. The birthmark on her neck. Her one toe longer than the others. Her freckled hands. He tries to hold her hands in his mind. He tries to remember the birth years of his sons. He tries to make sense of the papers he saw. The icy water wet again in his pants. The river stone sharp underfoot. The wind. I hold him like this in my mind all afternoon. Are there any WWF fans? And the cat there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sure. We're a dying green. Uh, when, I, when I was growing up, WWF wrestling was huge. I had it among my friends, and uh, we learned, we had all our favorite wrestlers' uh, moves memorized, and, uh, and we practiced them on each other. We, we kind of knew, but kind of didn't know that it was fake, and so we would hurt each other uh, sometimes. <laughs> this poem was also an excuse to use some of the, the moves' names, which are, uh, which are incredible texture. This is also the title. 
Tava. We were vicious. Swollen cheekbones, bruised jaws, forearms chafed raw and weeping, the Boston crab, the Texas clover leaf, the cross-faced chicken wing. One time, Aunt wrenched my shoulder so hard I couldn't lift my arm for a week. Another time, Mike's brother Daryl tried a front flip slam off the back steps, landed face first in the dirt, wrist bone shot clear through the skin and gleaming. Mike's dad worked second shift at Pratt's, so if we were loud, he'd holler out the bedroom window. There was nothing he could do to punish us that we weren't already doing to each other. And we knew it. Like that time, Daryl showed us his pistol, a 22 he lifted from his friend's house. We passed it around, weighing it in our palms. It was heavier than it looked, but it felt good. He put the barrel in his mouth, and when we jumped up, he laughed and laughed. Priceless, he said, red face and gasping. You pussies almost wet your pants. We learned new moves, new ways to shock the body into miracles of pain the figure four lock. The vice grip, every muscle trembling, the tarantula, the camel clutch, mouth pressed against their ear, hissing, tap out, dickhead. You're not getting out of this, you're mine, kid. Tap out and it'll stop. The sharp shooter, the hammerlock. That sour hot breath in your ear and knowing you won't give in. You won't give him the satisfaction, you want it hurts more than anything. More than your dad's belt blistering your backside, more than a knife. And Daryl took that gun in his mouth and sounded the bolt the whole block. So much you grit your teeth against the theme, sharp kneecap bearing down on your chest, elbow torqued past its limit, and you swear you can bust out of yourself and look down at your body, helpless and small and trembling. Press your mouth to your own ear and whisper, not you, not you. I was happy. 
I slept in their bed. I read the mysteries on their shelves. Always something precious gone. Someone hot on the trail. I walked in borrowed boots across the frozen pasture and back each morning, each morning the feed, the spigot, the horse dragging its bulk against the stall. I walk out nights and stand on the same trampled spot in the yard and listen to the cold stirring in the cheap grass. Dull glow of a town on the horizon, hiss of snow. I lie in your bed under three heavy cotton blankets and worry about the horse and handling supplies. It was the life, and it was not mine. To sleep, I imagine the great slabs of the grand buried sidewise in the hills. To sleep, I counted the measures ticked out in the horse and the tub. Slow drip to keep the pipes in the tree. I'm just going to read two more ones. Uh, this next one was about Bitcoin, cryptocurrency. <laughs> I used to live in San Francisco, and as soon as I moved out there, I went through a bad breakup and ended up sleeping on my front porch. And, uh, and that friend happened to be on the cover of Forbes magazine, sporting a, uh, a Wayne Gretzky style mullet and flipping at like a gold coin into the camera. Really teasing. And if you don't have I mean, Bitcoin, is not actual, you can't hold it. So, it's uh, so, in a room. On the glass dim back porch of a friend's house on Folsom, I slept three weeks on a heap of powder wool blankets, a large ziplock of granola, and a jar of pistachio on the sill. I woke to bus traffic in the floorboards, the sun on my face, drank thin coffee and scoured the listings for a studio someplace more possible. Each day, nothing. And each day, I paced the bright, narrow side streets with my friend was taking time off and he was an expert in digital currencies. I'd tell him about the collapse of my marriage, and he'd tell me about the distant servers of my electronic coins by solving complex equations. The specialized equipment required for this kind of work. I would ask him basic questions and he would answer patiently. The coins are encrypted. The code is the currency. Value is determined by speculation. Those days, every detail had the glimmer of potential cruelty. Hot pink curtain caught in a shut window. A drain pipe signed King Baby in white out pen. Paper bag of potatoes rotting in the trunk of the car I borrowed to retrieve a great from the storage. I called him in about a place called a Thai restaurant and lied about how much I make in a year. He was from Pittsburgh. We talked about rain. I said he'd call later to tell me if I got it. On another walk, I asked my friend more questions. Will it replace cash? Yes. Is it untraceable? Yes. What happens when they run out of equations? A bus comes past, skimming the lowest branches of the ficus tree, giving a shade. It's not like that, I said. You go on forever. Uh, this is the last one we read. It's also the last one we love. It's called Behind the Eyes and Shiny. It takes a line from uh, Larry Lewis' poem called Blair Stars. And the passage is uh, if, you can, if you can imagine the mind as a place of continually visited, a city placed behind the eyes and shining. It's like his dad losing language in his life. Behind the eyes and shining. If I could say it once clearly, if I could get it right, if I could hold it all together in my mind, all and shook loose like dander and the sap sucker punching holes inside it. The chain link thrown through the church and wind for the ranch to speak. If I could pass my body through the seam between the shingle and the ridge beam, linoleum and plank, return as a termite, pitch me. If I could go back to that July in Northampton, blowing fibers out in the rich folks' attics, to when me and Aunt left the lower run and smoked blunts all day in the trailer, to when it was a scam and we knew it. If I could admit it was a scam, my father's voice soft from the machine, sober, asking me to call back. If I had to admit why I won't, if I had to reckon with what the past asks for the present, if I am here in his van, stale cigarillo smoke and a heavy redolence of the body, windows fogged over, my voice scared in the van, if I squat against the wheel well and look at those quiet hands, 
do not turn away. They tremble. But still. Edgar, thank you so much. Um, it was a beautiful meeting, and uh, we're really honored that you could be here. And it's Michael. Um, Edgar's book is getting a lot of attention. It's just come out. It's just in the New York Times among the uh, um, notable new um, publications of this uh, month. Uh, copies are available here, so pick it up. It's been getting a lot more attention. Um, and you're a real part of the conversation, so. Uh,